Hello, everybody. Live from AHR Expo uh, in wonderful, wonderful Vegas. Uh, we're streaming live from the Sporland booth. You guys want to come down and visit? It's uh, C2518. Um, right now, we're going to do a live stream with Matt Wood from Sporland. Matt, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the S3C controller. Not a lot of technicians are, are really familiar with it. Um, you want to go into some of the things that it's able to do and, and, and what, what's the full capability of this controller? Yeah, absolutely. So the S3C product is our, our case controller that speaks back net and is capable of you know, a, a lot of things, but it controls the case, the lights, and uh, take in. I have a turn. Um, it, so anything you need your case controller to do, that's what we're trying to do with the S3C. Okay. You know, the product integrates with uh, you know, building automation systems, allows for higher level supervision as well as standalone applications. Got to learn how to do this uh, <laughs> too far away from the so you know we, we can we can do uh, uh, single single evaporator operation or is it is it for multiple as well? It, it, yes, it's got a, a an expansion module we call it the valve module. So if you need more expansion devices or if you need to control an eeper, you would add on that uh, what we call our valve module, and then you get more outputs, the ability to control those. Things. Okay, and and you know the the full capability of this thing, it, you can either control it with uh, you know the superheat with a pulse width expansion valve as well as an EEV, correct? Yeah, you are correct. It's really up to the end user and uh, the installing contractors what their preference is, but we support both. And we, we see a lot of adoption of the pulse width technology, so those are definitely supported by the S3C. So I, I was looking at some of the valves that you guys have on display here, and and, and you guys do have a, a pulse width uh, expansion valve that's here. Um, you know, it's it's it, it seems a little bit more robust than than what I'm typically used to. I mean, a lot of times they have a plastic strainer on the inside, and these ones they're actually actually constructed with metal uh, strainer that are reusable. I'm assuming you guys have rebuild kits as well for you know for those valves. Yeah, you're correct. We do offer rebuild kit, and it it is a robust valve. You know, rated for uh, CO2 type pressures, and uh, it, it is a, a valve a product that we we see applied a lot on CO2 systems. Uh, I think we do have some samples. You mentioned it's got a, a steel strainer uh, on the inside, which might be a differentiating factor. And the rebuild kits will include everything you need to, to take that valve, pull off the enclosing tube, pull off the coil. and rebuild. So are they comparable to like the, the BQ valves where I can actually change that orifice? So I'm not, so let's just say a uh, manufacturer installs the wrong, wrong size port in there for that expansion valve. Am I able to actually remove the, the orifice that's in there and, re, and rebuild it with the proper one that's in there? We do have uh, removal orifices that are threaded in, so you know orifices can be ordered separately. But uh, you know, primarily, we'd have those installed from the factory. The best case scenario would be to have them installed you know, correctly. But we understand things happen <laughs> <laughs> too many times, right? No, it's um, uh, it's it's a great product. We you know we've dealt with it a lot uh, on a lot of the stores that we deal with. Um, you know, we've we've uh, you know the the communication is very robust. Uh, the only thing you really have to watch with, and it's it's not a swirling thing, it's it's a location thing. Is is just like anything else. These controllers do not like water, so they just need to be far, far away. But I mean, you know, that's the the one of the good things about this. Where you know, years ago, where you had to you know run your communication cable, and you also had to run all your sensor wires and the EV and everything else. You know, this way everything is modular, right near it. So the only thing you have to run is one communication cable, and you guys. Uh, you know, use uh, typically from controller to controller, you guys use IP, right? Use, uh, you know, internet protocol. And then basically, you know, a lot of times I've seen where, you know, the primary controller that's connected to the BAM, uh, BMS system is basically 485 to that system. Yeah. So we, you know, you have the ability to, to loop your communication back as well if you want to make sure that, that you don't have a situation where a case could fail and stop the, you know, the communication to other cases. So uh, that's exactly right. Wonderful. No, I, um, we've used them. Uh, where, where other projects have you guys been installing? I, predominantly, I've seen you know Sam's Club. I've seen I've seen them uh, also be in, in Walmart's here late. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, multiple end users adopt it. I know we've uh, had projects with Target as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, most supermarkets have it's available to them. 
and we just see that uh, general trend of adoption of case controls. You know, uh, it continues to increase. Uh, more people are open to it, like the uh, electronic uh, valves and all the sensors that come with it. Have that ability to uh, to monitor a lot more things. You know, because they're going to be electrified already. Absolutely. One of the uh, one of the things uh, that I did want to talk about, uh, you guys have the availability to also control the anti sweats based off of a dew point sensor that you guys can ins install on your case controller. Correct? No, that's correct. We have an available uh, available sensor for that. Okay, and what is there set points in there? Like, what are you trying to maintain? Is there a certain dew point that you're shooting for? Uh, it's really sort of uh, depends on how the customer wants it set up. But yeah, we could control to that specific dew point set point. Um, it, I don't think it's it's employed by a lot of customers at this point, um, but as uh, regulation standards and what people are wanting to uh, to follow changes, I think we're going to see a lot more adoption of that. You know, people are now looking at using other methods more commonly than the, the dew point that they're that they're encountering. And it's all about at this point, it's it's hitting that UL rating, making sure that we can be energy efficient. Correct? Absolutely, and that's what that offers you and I think we're going to see a lot more of it is as things increase as, as requirements increase people are going to be really wanting to monitor their, their viewpoint. Um, one thing I do have to say about the S3C controller uh, there's a lot of uh, you know other manufacturers that are out there and one of the biggest things that you know Sporlin does extremely well with their control is their PID control. Uh, a lot of times I've seen where case controllers end up overshooting superheat, and and I'm actually really amazed at, at how close that we can control that. Yeah, I, you know everybody does it different. And our case controller really tries to optimize the superheat uh, that we see at the cases. You know, obviously you want to keep from slugging the compressor, but you know we we make sure we can get as low as we can. Uh, and, and still keep that, uh, you know, keep liquid from returning from, to the compressor. Well, I, if you, you have nothing else about the S3C, I wanted to talk a little bit about expansion valves, um, you know, because they're being used, uh, electronic expansion valves are being used more and more on, on all manufacturers across the board. And a lot of it's due to trying to save as much energy as possible. And what better way to do that with electronic control? Uh, you know, obviously, be, we, if we know how superheat's calculated, we have to make sure that the pressure is set correct we have to make sure that the refrigerant is actually set proper and we also have to make sure that the temperature sensor for the suction is in the proper location and that's the first and foremost thing when dealing with any of these controllers making sure that you know where all these sensors are supposed to you know be hanging out at absolutely true i mean they're very smart valves as long as you set them up for success but uh, just like anything else if you don't have the right inputs it can't give you the right output Absolutely. It's, you know, I, I tell my technicians all the time, you give me bad information, you're going to get a bad diagnostic. And the same way with, you know, any kind of, you know, case controller, if you're giving it uh, where the suction line temperature sensor is on the liquid line, it's really not going to operate well. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to select the right sensor. You have to have all the right endpoints. You have to, you have to have the, the controller set to accept those. But uh, it, as long as you get those details correct, you're going to have the ability to monitor which you don't have with a mechanical device. You're going to have the ability potentially to remotely monitor, which you also don't have with a mechanical device all the time. Yeah, step, uh, you know, having everything programmed, making sure that the pressure transducer is, is you know, set right in the controller. Uh, really important is making sure that the expansion valve or EPR that you have being controlled from that case controller is programmed correctly. Uh, worst thing you could do is, uh, you know, program it incorrectly, and then basically you have A, where you have erratic superheat, and then B, you could potentially overdrive that valve severely and end up damaging that that particular you know control. That's true. And you know, sizing any expansion device is important, but some people have the misconception that it's an electronic valve, so it'll it'll really make up for poor sizing. And that's something that you know it really needs to be done correctly. Size the valve right. Yes, you can operate across uh, a lot of the steps, but it won't be optimal, and you may not like how it performs if it's not sized correctly. I, I could agree with that. What um, um, I saw, I saw some new uh, electronic expansion valves over there. I saw some unipolar stuff. Yeah, we, uh, you know, Sporland has historically offered wet stator bipolar products, you know, but as the market has moved, we have moved to offer unipolar uh, dry stator valves. We have our OEV product line, which is targeted towards refrigeration uh, to give that unipolar control. It's sized 
uh, in, and even named similar to our SER products. So we have the OEV uh, AA through D, and we have the SER products of the same. We have our air conditioning targeted valves as well. So you know that would be our SEV and our CEV products. So we do have a wide range of dry stator uh, unipolar type products. So this is this is a question that I always wondered, like why why you know I, obviously you make bipolar valves, obviously you make unipolar valves. What makes one better than the other? What you know what makes you decide that hey we're gonna for this op application like for the core sense modules, mm -hmm. you know they use unipolar uh, unipolar expansion valves. Um, you know in supermarket we use predominantly. I mean from my experience we use the bipolar stepper. So I mean what really makes it that you know you, the deciding factor is there any you know, positives and negatives of doing either? Sure. Uh, you know, I, the actual control scheme to want to drive a unipolar versus a bipolar, I, I don't see as a huge driving factor. So that would be a limiting factor for the controller, you know, just as the controller have that capability. Yeah. But historically, it's been the construction of the motor. You have a wet stator motor was, was something that we always felt was robust for refrigeration. Uh, especially, you know, 10, 20 years ago, dry stator motors couldn't always meet the requirements to be in a case environment, to be inside of a refrigerated space, and even to have, you know, the, the cleaning and the food product there uh, to meet those environmental requirements was tough. So a wet stator valve made sense, and it still does, but we have improved the technology for those dry stator type valves to the point where we, we in certain cases, find it uh, also to be an acceptable alternative. You still have uh, a external coil that moisture can get in between, but you know the design is robust and we've tested it and feel that it, it works in the application. Our SER and our larger wet stator products still are, are ideal products and ones that I would recommend for the harshest environments because the, the motor is really only exposed to the refrigerant versus those dry stators, the inside of the, between the coil winding and the the stator is could get moisture in it but again you know we, we've come a long way in technology is uh, is there any uh can you use the sma12 to drive the unipolar or is there is there a separate valve driver i'd have to purchase in order to drive that motor uh so no the sma12 is bipolar driver and that's a really good point in a product gap you know, there's a lot of, for Sporlin, bipolar valves out there, which drives the demand for that SMA-12 type of a controller. And as the unipolar valves are adopted, you can definitely expect us to have that on our roadmap to add that functionality. Today, I'd say we don't quite see the applications asking for it, but you're not the first person to ask me about that. So. Well, in, in residential, they use a bunch of the, of the unipolar motors. So, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that you guys are, are going to start to have to do something about it, right, in order for the operation for troubleshooting purposes, right? You're absolutely right. Residential unipolar is, is the way to go on residential, it appears. And uh, as that grows, we're going to have to grow with it. So the other two valves that I'm staring at over there, uh, steel valves with the with the brass body. You want to talk about that a little bit? I was kind of curious about that. I was going to ask you earlier. And, uh, you want to give me a, school me a little bit on those? Yeah. So if you're familiar, uh, you know, CO2 is sort of a big deal now. So it's uh, what's CO2? Uh, yeah, CO2. I, I guess you know it's uh, you don't have to worry about those uh, global warming potentials anymore, right? <laughs> but uh, no, CO2 uh, has been around for a while, and we saw this first in Europe that you know we were seeing transcritical co2 systems become more common people were willing to pony up the money to make sure that they were sort of ahead of any of the new regulations they weren't going to have to worry about what's coming next and we offer a gas cooler and a flash gas bypass valve so for any co2 transcritical system we have those two products they're they're in the larger size ranges so we have a, a gas cooler uh, valve i think is probably a little bit large in, in some applications, especially now that we see our, our uh, typical food retail customers starting to look at converting yeah. in a big way. So not only do we have those products in various sizes, but we have uh, you know, more in the works. So that's something that I'm excited to see in the next couple of years to see more of those type products uh, come out. So if anyone's ever familiar with the, you know, the basically the, the high pressure valve on the, the gas cooler line coming from, you know, what's referred to as the gas cooler, because it's once it hits that 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 point, it, you know, 87 degrees, it's it's 
transcritical. It's it's no longer subcritical. So, you know, there's no real measurable subcooling that you can really do. The numbers are really fictitious. So like on most CO2 applications, they basically have a, either an iPro, uh, CPC iPro, or they have a Danfoss 326. What do you guys have in store for that, for that answer for that? Or to control the gas cooler? Yes, yes, yeah. to control the valve. So it, that's great. Right now we have a valve positioner. So we rely on an external control source. It could be a, a, you know, a, a product, a third party product out there, yeah. or it could be a, you know, a product like a microthermal product. Um, but the valve positioner we use, a PSD4 positioner, would be that take in an, a, an analog signal and convert it to drive the valve. So, so you'd have to have another brain telling the, the your controller to do the zero to 10 or four to 20 or whatever you guys have set up for your input. And then basically that drives that valve. That is correct. What's the, what are the steps on that valve? Like typically like CDS valves, uh, the smaller ones are 2,500 steps, uh, 200 uh, steps uh, uh, per second, 10% overclosure. Uh, the bigger ones are usually 6386, 200 steps per second, 10% uh, overclosure, just to ensure, you know, uh, you know, it reseats whenever that, you know, it, it, it when it goes to fully close. Um, so I was just curious what the step rate was and, and that for our listeners. So that is a great point. And I knew you're going to catch me on something and that's something that I don't have <laughs> on the top of my head. So I am here feverishly so, searching our literature. All right. Well then, then I'll, I'll give you some buffer. So my first day here in Vegas, um, I was bored and we ended up, uh, you know, going over to, uh, you know, walking down the strip and ended up getting a tattoo. Did you find those numbers? <laughs> I feel like you just uh, pushed back past that uh, wound up getting a tattoo like really fast. And so <laughs> I, what what drove you to uh, to getting a tattoo? Here? Uh, I'm trying to finish my arm. So where's the gas cooler valve on there? No, no I'm no. kidding. I'm no, kidding. no. But my compressor. Oh, that is really cool. So my compressor. And then actually right here, that's Carl von Lindy. Holy He's God. a German born engineer. German. Yeah. Made it possible for the Guinness Brewery Company to brew beer in the in the summertime. Irish. All right. Now I'm I a nerd. Understand. I'm a nerd. So I, how much more has to be done to finish this? Um, so basically just going to get color. You just got to get colors. There going to be any other mainstays on that forearm? Um, I, I, th I think I'm full up. I think you are too. I think I'm full up. I'm, you know. Very good. I'm not, I'm not going to suggest a pin and port, but if you wanted a pin and port on there, you know. And, you know, I, I thought about getting the, you know, the, 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 the Sporl and Insignia where it's actually the two pins. Yeah. But, I mean, everyone's using balance port, so I, I need something else. That's a great point. <laughs> and back to your question, 2,500 yeah. steps is what we have on our gas cooler. Okay. Valves. So, uh, you know, it gives a little bit quicker transit time than that full 6386 that we have some of our, our historically larger valves. Mm -hmm. um, and we do offer multiple sizes on the gas cooler valve. Um, it does have that stainless steel body, and you know when you get to those transcritical critical pressures, that's the solution for for really uh, containing that pressure. So, um, you know, I, I've been enjoying myself in Vegas, and I, I want to say I, I appreciate you guys inviting me down here. Um, you know, Kevin, if you're listening, uh, funny story about Kevin. If uh, if anyone wants to know, um, he wasn't going to come down here. I think his wife wasn't a fan of him coming down here with me. I don't know why. Um, there could be reasons, but I have no idea. But anyway, so, um, I was talking to him on the way down here and he's like, you'll never guess where I'm going. And I took a guess of all the horrible places that he doesn't want to go back to. And so finally he's like, no, I'm actually coming to Vegas. So he's like 45 minutes away fixing a, a dumpster fire right now. And he's, I got him a press pass this morning. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping he actually comes over and says hello. I was going to say that's, that's too close to coming that not right? the whole way. You well, know? But he, you know, he's also, he, he, you know, he said to me, he's like, you know, I'm trying, I want to try to get this all fixed and I want to try to also visit, but I also don't want to get caught in the airport because like he lives in Indiana and right now they're expected to get feet of snow. I am uh, right there with him on that concern. We're at uh, Sporland's <laughs> headquartered in Washington, Missouri. So yeah. quite a few of us are wondering what the flight back is going to look like, whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> if there is one. <laughs> if there is one. I know I mean, my wife called me right before this and said, what are you doing? At the trade show. <laughs> I don't know when I'm coming it's home. It's 67 and sunny, and she's like, it, it's negative yeah. something. Get back here so you can freeze. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, Matt, I appreciate your time. All right. And it was an interesting conversation. I appreciate your time, man. I appreciate it. Same to you, and hopefully we can uh, have a couple more great days like this one. Absolutely. And, hey, guys, you know, swing by, uh, enter to win a ZoomLock Press. Um, they also have a, you know, play the Cool Zone uh, trivia game. Uh, where basically you answer some of the questions, you get enough questions right, and they get you a free mug. Uh, come on by, uh, booth number C2518.
Uh, come on by and visit. I'll be here until about six o'clock. Have a good one, guys.